righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the veil Christ for schools, families, and educators, adapted from a prayer by Meg Butcher. Father, this is the day you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. It may not look like we thought it would look, nor will tomorrow and the days to come. Help us to see the good in each day. Give our lives moments of laughter and lightheartedness, even in dark and trying times. The sun keeps coming up, and you remain the same. We are created in your image, God, to do good and great things to bring glory to your name. Each one of us were created with a purpose. Help teachers to have confidence in their craft. They were meant to teach, educate, coach, counsel, and lead. They are needed, appreciated, and loved by you. Their work and their efforts are never in vain. Thank you, Father, for technology, allowing many students to continue their educations online. Thank you for every teacher and educator adjusting the best they can. Comfort them as they miss interacting with their students in person. Equip them with energy and inspiration to come alongside their students in this challenging time. Protect their health, Father, physically and just as much mentally. Encourage them to use their gifts and talents to find ways to reach students. For the boards of education, principals, and staff of our schools, we pray blessings over their lives. May the leaders of our schools be blessed with wisdom in this difficult time. May the needs of students be seen, and God, we pray your provision to meet those needs. Bless our school staff. Keep them connected socially and working together for the greater good of each student. Empower all, staff, teachers, students, to stay inspired and reminded that impossible situations can be just the fuel for big dreams to be realized. Many students are facing loss of longed-for events and relationships. 
You grieve over us in every loss. Help both students and teachers to grieve losses in a healthy way. Help us all to be grateful for the things that have not been lost. This crisis may be longstanding, but it will not last forever, Father. May the hope of Jesus Christ be with every teacher, educator, bus driver, coach, counselor, principal, staff member, and student, because it is through the hope of Jesus that we can be assured somewhere, somehow, and some way, there is light at the end of this tunnel. Father, you know the heart of every teacher, educator, counselor, coach, aide, and staff member. You know their needs. You know their challenges. Be with them. And be our guide, Father. Show us who and how you might call us to help. Sustain us. Provide for us all, Father. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Kathy, remember last week when someone dropped us off some corn? Yeah. This week we got the gift of some fruit. Oh, I love fruit. I love fruit. Do you think it's peaches? That's pretty light. I'm not sure it would be peaches. Oh, hmm. Love. Peace. Self-control. Kindness? What kind of fruit is this? Oh, I get it. It's the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, Paul writes about the fruit of the Spirit, and he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what kind of fruit this is. Well, well, I love fruit like in my fruit bowl here. The fruit of the Spirit is so much better. Once you eat an orange, it's gone. But when you have the fruit of the Spirit in your life, it lasts a lot longer. You can have it every day for your entire life. Kids, no matter how much I love fruit like this, I love the fruit of the Spirit even more. Let's pray for that this morning. Dear Lord, I thank you for these children that are watching. I thank you for all the children in our lives, and I just pray that they would learn to walk with you and that the fruit of the Spirit would grow abundantly in their lives. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, kids. Galatians 5, 1-6 through 6. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith, expressing itself through love. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. 
The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. We are in a season where people of all different persuasions are crying out that their rights are being infringed on. Some of them have legitimate complaints. I believe there is economic and racial disparity. I believe there is business and government overreach. In this world, there is no perfect system because we are imperfect people. But I would propose that overall, most Americans today have more resources, opportunities, choices, and freedoms than the vast majority of people across history and across the globe will ever know. And yet, as a nation, we seem to be less grateful than ever. Certainly, the Apostle Paul, the writer of today's epistle, would look at anyone who is not grateful for the religious freedom we have and think we're a little spoiled. Now, raise your hand. How many of us have been beaten for our religious beliefs? How many flogged? How many imprisoned? And yet, Paul's call to the early church in Galatia is as relevant today as it was then, like so many letters of the New Testament we've explored in our summer worship series. Paul starts the fifth chapter of Galatians with these words. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So many of us live lives that are not truly free. We're captives to guilt, shame, anxiety, and fear. We too often go through life carrying burdens. Some of us are weighted down by things we have done or have had happen to us years ago. Some of us are carrying burdens we don't even realize we are still holding on to. Paul writes the letter to the Galatians to remind them of Jesus' gift of freedom. Dear Church, you are called to be free. Your loving pastor, Paul. Paul gets more detailed about this freedom in Christ in verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Christ freed us not just because freedom is a good thing. There's a purpose in this free life of Christ. We are called to be free from the penalty of sin. This isn't necessarily a get-out-of-jail-free card for this life. When we sin, there are often consequences, ranging from your spouse getting mad at you to paying a fine or spending some time in jail. Jesus' freedom means he paid the price so that you don't have to. And it's good to remember that, even if it's free for us, it cost Jesus a lot. Since my husband and I have become pastors, we've received many free gifts like the bag of sweet corn Jeff mentioned in the children's chat, as well as other produce. We received free home-cooked meals after my surgery earlier this year. We've gotten free blueberry donuts during the blueberry festival and bags of bluegill in fishing season. These were free to us, but someone else had to buy it or grow it and bring it to our doorstep. Free things we receive cost somebody time, money, and effort. The gifts we give others may start with a momentary decision, but they're the result of time and effort when we actually give them. How many of us are enjoying and using the freedom given to us by the costly sacrifice of Christ? Second, we're called to be free from the grasp of sin. Paul writes, 
Do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. I don't know, but I'm assuming that when you've given something to someone else, you know it, that they have a choice what they do with it. But aren't you glad when they use it or eat it or drink it and enjoy it rather than throwing it away? If we choose to walk in the flesh, we put ourselves back under the bondage of sin. When we indulge in acts of the faith with sexual immorality, moral corruption, doing whatever feels good, idolatry, drug use, and casting spells, hate, fighting, obsession, losing your temper, competitive opposition, conflict, selfishness, group rivalry, jealousy, drunkenness, partying, and other things like that, we run the risk of taking on more shame, guilt, and brokenness after Christ died to take away these weights. It's like putting yourself back in a jail cell once you've been released, willingly stepping back inside and inviting the guard to lock it up again. Third, we are called to live free to serve God and others. Rather, Paul writes, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Our freedom in Christ is not simply to do whatever we want. It's to serve others in love. When we do that, the gift of freedom we receive from Christ can be regifted or passed on to others. It's like giving the key to the cell to another inmate rather than walking away and leaving them inside the cell. So, how do we find freedom in Christ? First, live by the Spirit, not by the flesh. Paul says the Spirit and flesh are in conflict with each other, so that we are not to do whatever we want. God gives us freedom, but doing whatever we want can end in ruin for us and for others. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, since we live by the Spirit. Kyle Eidemann describes living in our own power that it's like thinking we are a power strip and we can meet our desires by plugging things into this power strip. I have the power to do this, so I plug what I want into my power strip. I want this, plug it into my strip. When I see there is one more outlet left in the power strip, I take the plug and plug it in, like the picture, and get nothing. Because we don't have the power in ourselves to live the abundant free life God offers us. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to live an abundant and free life. There is anger in Paul's words in part of the book of Galatians. Paul says to the Galatian church, you were free in Christ. Now you're trying to make yourselves right with God in your own power. You think these decisions about whether someone is circumcised or not has anything to do with earning God's righteousness? You think making and following man-made rules or performing sacrifices in just the right way has anything to do with God's grace? It is only God's power through Jesus Christ that can save you and give you the abundant life. You can't plug yourselves in. How do we find freedom in Christ? We walk with God and others. We need the help of God and others to live freely. We may think freedom means independence, but freedom in Christ means we depend on God and others to help us. There are less hassles walking alone than walking with someone, for a while at least. No fighting about which direction to go or how fast to travel. You can take breaks whenever you want, go through supplies as fast as you want. But walking alone, it is easier to get lost. Walking alone can be scary at times. And when you want to run out of supplies and you're all alone, that's the end of it. When you walk together, you can carry supplies more efficiently. You can encourage, encourage each other. There's a saying about this. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with others. The most important person to go with is God. We go with God when we start the day in his word. We go with God when we treat people like Jesus would treat them. We go with God when we listen for his Holy Spirit to speak to us. 
Week after week, I try to find new ways of encouraging you to find time to learn from the Bible, spend in prayer, and listen to God. But I also encourage you to walk through life with Christian brothers and sisters who are walking with God. When we serve one another humbly in love, rather than serving ourselves selfishly in our own flesh, we walk together in Christ. And when we walk together in love, be that in a family, a church, a community, or a nation, we have more freedom in our lives than we have with any rules made by our families, churches, communities, or nation. How do we find freedom in Christ? We walk step by step, one step at a time. This is perhaps the point that hit me strongest as I thought about freedom in the Christian life. Paul says that when we live for Christ, when we walk with Christ, we will bear the fruit of the Spirit. I absolutely believe that people whose lives are filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control are more free than those whose lives are marked by hate, bitterness, impatience, rudeness, and a need for instant gratification. Here's the point that hit me. Mature fruit doesn't appear overnight. Our sins can be forgiven in a moment, but living the full, abundant, free life in Christ requires growth over time. The Greek language has many words for traveling by the feet, and many of these different ones are used throughout Scripture. Words like race, running, racing, skipping, hopping, plodding. The Greek used here is the most boring word for walk you can use. It just means one foot in front of the other, step by step. Walk by the Spirit, not by our fleshly desires, one step at a time. We want to reach spiritual maturity in a flash. Spiritual highs are wonderful. Conversion experiences, mission trips, spiritual retreats, and mountaintop moments are wonderful and used by God in powerful ways. Because that, because that is true, many people chase spiritual experiences and spiritual highs. We want a super caffeinated Red Bull kind of Christianity. Many people quit Christianity when the excitement wears off. Most of the time, for most of us, the Christian life is a step-by-step, moment-by-moment, one little decision by one little decision, walk with the Spirit instead of the flesh. Little choices like doing morning devotionals instead of sleeping in. Spending some moments in prayer instead of electronic distraction. Doing a daily Bible reading rather than following the news of the world or sports for hours. Conversations with Christian friends that don't necessarily solve all the world's problems, but uplift us. Instead of gossiping or complaining. Little acts of service instead of little choices of selfishness. Choosing to thank God for what he's given us instead of being angry about what we don't have. Step by step, often unnoticeable step by step, we can end up in a very different place spiritually. This year I started counting steps a little more than I did in the past. What difference does one step make? Really none, but would you believe that I've walked over a million steps already this year? I could have walked to my sister's home in southern Indiana and back. Day by day I see no difference, but I know I would be in way worse shape and carrying way more calories than I have because of each of those little steps taken day after day. Imagine that spiritually. Imagine over the course of a lifetime the number of imperceptible, hardly noticeable steps we take in the flesh or in faith. Where we end up ultimately has a lot to do with those thousands of tiny steps we walk with the Spirit over a lifetime. Paul says freedom in Christ is a life filled with the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things, there is no law. This is a time of year when many of you are enjoying the bountiful produce from your gardens, the fruit of your labors for the past several months or perhaps years. Very few types of fruit grow quickly. Planting a seed for a watermelon or a sapling for an apple tree is exciting and we can be full of anticipation, but it takes time and care for the fruit to grow. A season for a watermelon and years for an apple tree to produce fruit. We often grow impatient 
waiting for the fruit to grow. In our faith life, that can also be true. In the beginning, it's often exciting to realize you are free from past debts to sin. But we soon realize that for our faith to grow, the fruit of the Spirit to become more abundant in our lives, faith has to work itself out in love, step by step, day by day, month by month, year by year, of inviting the Holy Spirit to be at work in our lives. Paul says if the Spirit fills you with love, no law can take that away from you. If you have the joy of the Spirit, no law can take that away from you. If you have God's peace, no one can take it away from you. As you move through your week, take these challenges from Paul with you. First, remind yourself often that Jesus has set you free. There's no reason to put yourself back in bondage to sin. Second, walk one step at a time in the spirit rather than the flesh. Each decision you make step by step, day by day. And third, use your freedom as the power to serve others, not to serve yourself. Dear church, you are called to be free. Your loving pastor, Paul. And now to him who by means of his power working in us is able to do so much more than we can ever ask for or even think of. To God be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ for all time, forever and ever. Amen.